Hello America, and happy birthday, Mr. President. I'm Tom Hand, creator of Americana Corner. We are thrilled to be a part of George Washington's birthday celebration. I started Americana Corner about two years ago to remind Americans of their nation's incredible history and why it still matters to us today. Each week, we produce stories and videos about the men and women who created this wonderful country in which we live. We are also excited about our new Americana Corner grant program, which provides funding for other organizations focused on America's first century. I want to thank the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, our nation's oldest patriotic women's group, for the work they do and have been doing since Mrs. Cunningham founded the association in 1853. It is a privilege for Americana Corner to be the lead sponsor for this national event honoring George Washington's life and legacy. And I would encourage all of us to follow his example of service to country. Thank you for your time and please enjoy your evening. Welcome America to the 290th birthday celebration for George Washington. Since its founding, our nation has paid tribute to the father of our country with parades, performances, and parties. You are now part of this tradition. We are delighted to welcome you to Mount Vernon for our very special national birthday celebration. Americans from around the country are watching together as we honor this extraordinary man and his legacy. Can you imagine the responsibility George Washington must have felt during his lifetime? First, he outmaneuvered and secured independence from England. Not only the mother country, but the greatest superpower of the age. He resigned his commission at the end of the war, prompting his adversary, King George III, to remark, if he does that, he will become the greatest man in the world. And then, at the behest of the fledgling nation, he left his beloved Mount Vernon to carry his leadership burden and the great expectations from his fellow citizens. He helped set up our government, established the executive branch, created new institutions, and even shaped the capital city that bears his name 15 miles up the Potomac. Time and again, George Washington faced the challenge of setting American precedents with style and dignity. And we're going to celebrate that today with our theme, Washington, a man of firsts. There's much to understand and appreciate in what he accomplished for our young country. Now here at his beloved home, Mount Vernon, it's our mission to preserve his legacy as we preserve this beautiful estate. We're grateful for your support in keeping his spirit alive and well, particularly on this auspicious day of 2-2-2-2022. So on behalf of Mount Vernon, we'd like to say happy birthday, General George Washington. Hip, hip, huzzah. Now let's get this party started. Good evening. My name is Joe Somerset. As co-chairs of Mount Vernon's Neighborhood Friends, my wife Ann and I are delighted to join you tonight to celebrate George Washington's 290th birthday. Americans have a long-standing tradition of celebrating George Washington's birthday. Since the American Revolution, we've done so with parades, parties, performances, and dances. This evening, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association continues that tradition by bringing us together to celebrate our founding father. For me, it's incredibly appropriate that there are Americans all over the country tuning in together this evening. George Washington took 13 very different colonies, and together they became one of the greatest nations the world has ever seen. It's really inspiring to know that he can still bring us all together tonight. Tonight, we can also get together to raise funds to support this historic estate. There's an auction going on with exciting trips, memorabilia, and adventures that you can bid on. So go online, check it out, and help support this special place. And so it is our distinct pleasure to welcome you this evening to Mount Vernon's second annual national birthday celebration where we will celebrate George Washington, a man of firsts. So I think, should we join the party? Come on. Join us. Welcome ladies and gentlemen and Americans of all ages to the national birthday party for George Washington. On his 290th birthday, we celebrate George Washington as a man of many firsts. And now, your host for the evening, Mount Vernon's own 
Dean Norton. Hey, welcome to the party. We're here at Mount Vernon, and we're going to celebrate all evening with George Washington's 290th birthday party. We have such a great evening in store for you tonight. Do not turn that channel. You know what? There are many firsts that we're going to share tonight, and you're going to enjoy every single one of them. But what I want you to do, we need your generosity. We're going to raise a lot of money through just sending us your money and bidding on some wonderful auction items. So let's have a great time. Huzzah. 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 Good evening, everyone. We are Audra and McAnnan of the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Friends and co-chairs of tonight's birthday auction. We are honored to be working together in this important fundraiser and birthday celebration honoring George Washington. Our auction is now live with some truly remarkable items. We have some great items. We have over 15 experiences and destination trips. This ranges from Jackson Hole down to Cape Cod to New Orleans, to Charleston, there's some truly amazing and things. And London too, we have some international trips. Oh, we love London. That, mm -hmm. London would be amazing, that's mm -hmm. an amazing trip. There are also over 75 items and that include art, antiques, and some truly uh, unique... Rare one-of-a-kind one items. One-of-a-kind uh, items that all have to do with George Washington and the Revolutionary period. So what you need to do is text GEORGE to 56651. That's GEORGE to 56651. Just click the link, follow it, and you're in. And don't forget, all proceeds go directly to benefit Mount Vernon. So if you just text George to 56651, you'll be all set to take part in tonight's auction. So bid early and bid often. Happy and birthday, George. Happy bidding. Okay, we're going to start tonight's first of Washington's first with Joe Ellis. Joe Ellis is an award-winning author, actually a Pulitzer Prize-winning author, and his presentation is First in War. Now, that is actually from a famous eulogy written by Henry Lee, Light Horse Harry Lee. Do you guys know what that is? All right, let's shout it out. Ready? First in war. First in peace. First in the hearts of his countrymen. Take it, Joe. George Washington was looking to make it to the next century, the 19th century, and he just missed. He died in 1799. And at the funeral for him, his old cavalry commander, Henry Lee, uttered the eulogy that might very well be the most famous eulogy in American history. First in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Why he was first in war is going to be the subject of my remarks now, and I'll try to be as succinct as possible. He was selected as commander of what became the Continental Army in June of 1775. John Adams said later that he was always chosen for any assignment because he was always the tallest man in the room. He was chosen for this assignment because he was the only man wearing his military uniform, and he was a Virginian. And he was also one of the most experienced uh, soldiers. He had commanded the Virginia Regiment during the French and Indian War. But compared to the kind of officers he was going to face from Great Britain, he was a rank amateur and he knew it. So he committed himself to the cause knowing that he uh, lacked the experience uh, that his opponents would have and he probably lacked the army that they would have in terms of professional soldiers. As a result, Washington lost more battles than he won during the war. And if you think about it, most of the great generals over time in world history win the battles but lose the war. Hannibal, Napoleon, Robert E. Lee, Rommel, Washington reversed that pattern. He lost battles, but he won the war. And the question really is how and why. He had two things that he had to overcome early in the war. Early on, especially in the Long Island and Manhattan campaign, he chose to contest Howe's presence in a battlefield that he couldn't possibly win on the archipelago where the British Navy gave him a great advantage. But why? Because he had an honor-driven sense of battle. A summons to battle was like a summons to duel in his view. You couldn't reject without losing your honor. Nor could you retreat even when it, when it was strategically necessary. As a result, he almost lost the war and the army in the first month of the war. Over time, he overcame that. He couldn't overcome the second liability that he wanted the Continental Congress to provide him with at least 50 or 60,000 troops. 
he reasoned that they could provide 80 to 100,000 demographically. But the army that he commanded never rose above a high point of 12 to 15,000 any given year. Most of the states refused to meet their levies and uh, they saw their own battle as a militia battle at the local level. As a result, it took a while for Washington to come to understand one basic thing that separated him from all the other military leaders of that time. Strategically, he came to the realization that he did not have to win the war. He had only not to lose it, an achievement that was much easier. And after Valley Forge, that was the principle that guided his tactics as well as his strategy. He fought a war of posts meaning he only engaged the enemy um, when he had superior numbers or terrain. And so at the end of the war, the British decide to withdraw after Yorktown, and he eventually ends up in Annapolis, where he surrenders his commission and symbolically his sword, um, and rides back to Mount Vernon alongside Billy Lee. At that moment, I want to quote from Jefferson, who was present. The moderation and character of a single man, he wrote, has probably prevented the revolution from being closed, as most others have been, by a subversion of the liberty it was intended to establish. Jefferson was probably thinking of precedents set by Caesar and by Cromwell. If he had a crystal ball, he could have also thought of Napoleon, of Lenin, of Stalin, of Mao, of Castro, and a host of African dictators. The, the pattern is clear. Uh, great generals and great leaders never leave power. Washington was an aficionado of exits, and his greatest achievement as a general was not to exercise power, but to surrender it. Upon this news, most of the European press was stunned. And when George III uh, was told that Washington had surrendered power, he said, if he does that, he will become the greatest man in the world. He did, and at least from the moment, he was. And he set a precedent as a military leader, which has resonated and through, echoed through the ages, that no matter how indispensable, and Washington was the closest thing in American history to an indispensable man, you are disposable. This republic is a government of laws and not of men. It is a principle that I think echoes now as we face some of the decisions as a people and that we should listen to and will allow us to look back and recognize why George Washington was the foundingest father of them all. Welcome back, everyone. I have a few items I want to point out to you here. I have item 154. This is an original Courier and Ives, and if you're not familiar with Courier and Ives, Google it. We have George Washington. Careful, honey, this is expensive. I know, I'm holding it. Um, we have Martha as well, and these date back to the 19th century, about 1870s. Um, and bid now, because this is not going to last for long. You better believe it. So bid, okay? So it's my honor now to introduce to you Kevin Butterfield, the executive director of the Washington Library, and he's going to tell a story about Washington's first inaugural address. As we know, George Washington was first in so many ways in American history. One of the ways that he was first happened on April 30th, 1789, when George Washington delivered not just his first inaugural address, but the first inaugural address. On that day, after taking the oath of office on a balcony in New York, represented right here behind me from the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston, George Washington walked into the Senate chamber and delivered his address. It was an interesting moment. William McClay, a senator from Pennsylvania, was actually somewhat disappointed. He was concerned that Washington wasn't in fact the best public speaker. He pointed out that after Washington delivered the words all the world, he made what he called an ungainly gesture with his right arm. He said, I was disappointed he wasn't first in everything. But George Washington had a goal that day. He stood in front of the members of Congress and encouraged them to consider exercising their power under the fifth article of the Constitution, to consider amendments. 
what he was encouraging them to consider were to find ways to more impregnably fortify, to use his words, the characteristic rights of freemen. I think you can see what I'm going for here. George Washington advocated for what we now know as the Bill of Rights. Within a week, James Madison began action on the floor of the House of Representatives to bring amendments for their consideration. Within three weeks, there were 17 amendments being discussed, and within two years, 10 amendments to the Constitution were ratified by three quarters of the states, and we had what we now call the Bill of Rights. It was a hugely important moment in American history, and we have George Washington's first inaugural address to thank for it. He moved the political needle, turning talk into action. I'm delighted to be able to tell you about one of the many, many ways that George Washington was first in our history. Thank you so much. Happy birthday, George Washington. Well, Washington's cabinet, which I think is one of his greatest creations as president, was basically a replica of the councils of war that had been so beneficial during the revolution. He learned the value of getting advice and support from people who had different expertise and knowledge than his own. And he copied and pasted most of the practices from the councils of war directly into the executive branch. The Constitution doesn't mention the word cabinet, and in fact, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention explicitly rejected proposals for a cabinet. Instead, the Constitution says that the president may request written advice from the department secretaries. And that written part was really important because it was supposed to provide evidence about who said what and who advocated which position. But the issues facing the president were so complex and so difficult and required the input of so many intelligent advisors that after a couple of years of trying to make do with written correspondence and one-on-one -on -one meetings, Washington convened his first cabinet meeting on November 26, 1791. Washington had three criteria for who he selected for the cabinet. So first, they had to have experience and knowledge about their position, which makes sense. You want to have good advisors. And he wanted that experience to be different than his own. So for example, for the Secretary of State, Washington didn't speak French, which was the language of diplomacy. And he had never been to the court of St. James or Versailles, and he needed someone who understood diplomacy in Europe. So Thomas Jefferson was a great choice for the first Secretary of State. His second criteria is that he had to know them and trust them. Of course, if you're going to take advice from someone, it's helpful if you trust that advice. And finally, he wanted to have diversity in his cabinet. Now, this isn't 21st century diversity, of course, because they're all white men, but they represented different ways to be an American, different economic, social, cultural, factional, economic backgrounds and interests. And his contemporaries understood that Washington was trying to make sure the entire nation was represented and felt heard in his administration. Because the Constitution doesn't mention the cabinet and instead mentions the Senate and written advice, Washington's creation set precedent for all of the people that followed him. And Washington created the cabinet to be a very personal, intimate advisory body meaning he would meet with them when it was helpful and he would not meet with them when he didn't want to. And that precedent has continued to shape presidents today. Presidents get to decide who their closest advisors are going to be, whether it's in the cabinet, it's a former business acquaintance, friends, family members, senators, but each president decides for himself or herself. And those relationships generally take place without congressional or public oversight. Man, that was great. You know, Lindsay, I love Washington's criteria for picking his first cabinet. You know, if you wanted to talk to him, he did. If not, he didn't. I mean, I think that's great. Now, for your viewing entertainment, we have some wonderful birthday wishes for George Washington from special guests all around this country. Enjoy. Happy birthday, George Washington! Hi, my name is Ty. I'm here at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. We celebrate George Washington because he was the first president of the United States and the first commander in chief. Happy birthday, George Washington. Hi, my name is Katie Mars. Hi, I'm Savannah Rogers, and we are standing here in the Academical Village at Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia, where I'm a graduate student. And I work in student health. One of the things I admire the most about George Washington is that he stepped down from power in a time when that really wasn't a precedented thing to do. 
And I really admire that the lessons that he taught in the 18th century and led by example with are still lessons applicable to us today. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, George! Happy birthday, George Washington! Hi folks, this is Joni Ernst, junior senator from the great state of Iowa. As a retired lieutenant colonel in the Iowa Army National Guard, it's an honor to join you all to celebrate our nation's first Commander-in-Chief. As one of our founding fathers, George Washington set the example for the importance of public service. Hundreds of years later, millions of Americans have followed in his footsteps and selflessly served our nation to ensure our freedom and liberties endure. On behalf of Iowans and Americans across the country, I'd like to wish General Washington a happy birthday. Hey George, I heard it's your birthday. Birthdays are so exciting. Happy, happy birthday, birthday George, the Washington Ballet is not My name is Bobby Isbell and I'm here at Harvard Law School where I am a first year student and just wanted to say happy birthday George Washington and what I'm thinking about most on this day is his legacy of giving up power and not taking it and his spirit of selflessness and service. So happy birthday George. Happy birthday George Washington. Hi, I'm Don Byer representing Virginia's 8th Congressional District, the home to George Washington's Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is a special place of pilgrimage and pride for so many Americans, dedicated to the memory of America's Cincinnatus. First in war, first in peace, George Washington embodies the character of our American spirit. And it's an honor to serve the 8th District where his legacy lives on. So happy birthday, George. Meg and I wish you a happy 290 years. Hello, my name is Natalie Hernandez, and I am the president of the Washington's Birthday Celebration Association in Laredo, Texas. What began in 1898 as a two-day event has now grown to a month-long celebration with something for everyone. This year, we are celebrating our 124th Washington's Birthday Celebration and invite all of you to join us to celebrate Laredo style. Happy birthday, George Washington! Yeah! Okay, if you love bourbon, if you like bourbon, if you want to get to know bourbon, this is the item for you. Heaven Hill Distilleries. Oh, Heaven Hill? Heaven Hill. Oh. Elijah Craig, Evan Williams, oh Larceny. Gosh. They have amazing stuff. So the home of, the home of bourbon, Louisville, Kentucky, um, Heaven Hill has given us a bourbon boot camp. So what you do is you work with the distiller from grain to barrel. You work with them to make the bar their, their, their number one barrel for the day. You sign the barrel before it goes into the aging process for the, to the caskery. There's also an, an option where you get to go a you do you where you make your own bourbon, which is based on the flavors that you'd like to do. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, the stay in Louisville is at the Brown Hotel. This is one of the historic hotels of America. It, there's a suite there for, uh, for two, but the item at, the, at, Bur at Heaven Hill is for six, up to six people. So it's, it's a couple's trip. This is a guy's trip. This is a girl's trip. Girls love bourbon. Um, this is an amazing item that you, what, you need to bid on this. This is going to go fast. It's a one, truly a once-in-a-lifetime thing uh, for enthusiasts. Bid on it. It's going to go. Dean? Okay. Yeah. Oh, man. $100. Put me down $100. Okay. Now, I want to introduce to you. That's not going to do it, by the way. Okay. $200. Right. Let right. me introduce to you. Keep going. All right. Just be quiet. All right. So, let me introduce to you two people that I know you know. And actually, the first one, George Washington knows, and that is his first Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson. And then we're going to move forward 200 years and hear from another Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. Cheers. Well, good day, my friends. My name is Thomas Jefferson, and welcome here to Al Monticello. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to say a few words on behalf of my old friend, General George Washington. And when I say my old friend, I do not mean in his age. I am talking about our long acquaintance. In fact, the general was a good friend of my late father, Colonel Peter Jefferson. Then Major George Washington and my father were commissioned by the old Royal Authority here in the former colony of Virginia to survey many lands out here in the wilderness. 
Of course, I remember well when George Washington and I sat together in the old Virginia House of Burgesses there in Williamsburg during the latter 1760s, the early 1770s. And I'll never forget being present in the Continental Congress in Philadelphia that summer of 75, when we welcomed the honor to commission Colonel Washington as the first general of the first American army. How well you know, the general and I worked together closely in his first cabinet there, in our first government under the Constitution. And so, if you will, in that reflection of our ancient friendship, I reiterate what I wrote in a letter, the very last line in my summation of my association with General George Washington. I quote, in every sense of the words, he was a very good, a very great, and a very wise man. Happy anniversary of your birthday my good friend, George Washington. I am so happy to join the Mount Vernon family in celebrating the 290th birthday of our first president, George Washington. I'm really happy to do it because um, I think to myself that George Washington would have been really proud of uh, what he helped to bring about as this extraordinary experiment, the United States of America. It would be an America that he in many ways wouldn't recognize, but perhaps the one thing he would recognize is that we are still a people united by our values, united by our beliefs in liberty and the ability of human beings to self-govern. Perhaps he would also recognize that we've, uh, we've matured and we've changed and we've brought so many more people into we the people over those years. But I also want to say that it's important to celebrate this birthday because we were one very lucky nation that our first president was George Washington. When I would talk to young democracies across the world, I would say in some ways you just have to be sure that the institutions are strong. And indeed, we have strong institutions. But I always would say to them, you also have to be a little bit lucky in who that first president uh, is. And for us, George Washington was the, the perfect first president not willing to draw attention to himself, not wanting to be king, wanting instead to protect and preserve the Republic. And that he did extraordinarily well. And that's why we are here today to celebrate his birthday and to celebrate this extraordinary place, the United States of America. Hi. Hey, Dean, how you doing? Man? Again, I am great. You know, I saw in the online auction, you have a bit. You're going to teach people how to play fife. Is that right? It's going to be great. It's going to be a music lesson and some history about the Revolutionary War, how the fifes and drums were used. Ah, oh, come on, man. Well, you know, we have a lot of competition on the estate. Thank you, you fife, me, bugle. And I knew this was coming, so I've been teaching these young ladies how to play the bugle for the past couple months, because I just want to impress you, okay? Please. So so let's do it. Ready, young ladies? Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> What do you think, Doug? That was very interesting. Uh, uh, I'll give them lessons for free, Dean. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Hey, I called post for this auction back at 7 o'clock, but this race is far from over. We have several furlongs yet to go. We need to pace ourselves, but stay engaged. Keep bidding. Keep donating. But I want you to be ready for that final quarter mile, because we're going to kick it into gear. And if we do that, if you do that, we're going to cross that finish line winners. And then we are going to celebrate. Let's go. You've heard of many firsts for George Washington and his amazing career full of accomplishments. But have you ever thought about him being the first American celebrity? So many people wanted to see Washington that he referred to his home as a well-resorted tavern. Can you imagine the planning and preparation necessary for the Washingtons and the ten or so enslaved people in the house to feed and entertain dozens of people day in and day out? Despite the difficulties, the Washingtons were known to be gracious and welcoming hosts. One visitor even wrote in his diary that Washington himself bought a cup of tea in the middle of the night for his cough. 
When Washington was elected the first president, both he and Mrs. Washington were presented with an entirely new challenge. There wasn't a blueprint on how to be president. Washington's every action set a precedent for those to come. I can only imagine how stressful and scary that must have been. But since the Washingtons were so used to entertaining at Mount Vernon, they were able to transition into their new roles as America's first hosts fairly easily. President Washington welcomed dignitaries and members of Congress to a formal dinner every Thursday. With several courses served, these evenings tended to be stuffy. Perhaps this was caused by members of varying political parties sitting together. Senator William Mackley, a non-federalist from Pennsylvania, wrote, It was a great dinner, but I considered it part of my duty as a senator to submit to it, and am glad it's over. While the Thursday dinners may have been overly formal, Mrs. Washington hosted a levy or reception every Friday. These were far more jovial with lemonade, orange aid, tea, wine, delicious fruits, and dessert tables with cakes in the winter and ice cream in the summer. These receptions provided a more relaxed atmosphere for discussion, politicking, and even fun. Mrs. Washington's charm even won over the general's harshest political adversaries. Hi, it's Shinema Hanna Naramali here, coming to you from Millennium Bridge in front of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, United Kingdom. I celebrate George Washington because he recognized that leadership is as much about humility as it is about strength. Happy birthday, George Washington. Happy birthday, George Washington. Hello, I am John Andrea Noseda, music director of the National Symphony Orchestra here in DC. And look, I am just a finish a rehearsal and I conduct the National Symphony Orchestra at the Kennedy Center. But no one conducted this country better than George Washington. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Hi, I'm Virginia Senator Mark Warner, and I'm proud to join in the celebration of the birthday of our first president, Virginian George Washington. And I want to particularly honor Mount Vernon in terms of its efforts to preserve and present that critical part of American history and the critical role that George Washington played. Hey everybody, it's Liam Elkins, Mount Vernon Leadership Fellows Class of 2019. I'm here in Connecticut just enjoying the snow. I celebrate George Washington because he voluntarily gave up power. He knew that leadership and legacy was about service over self. And for that, I and our entire country will be forever grateful. So happy birthday, George Washington. I hope you're having a good one. Happy birthday, George Washington. Today, we celebrate and remember George for the strong and humble leader that he was and still is to our country. He wasn't afraid of failure, and we shouldn't be either when it comes to doing the right thing. Thank you for teaching me this through your leadership. Happy birthday, George Washington. This is Brian Burr. I'm at 16th and K in front of the White House and Washington Monument. I celebrate George because, um, like any hero, he's complex, but I think he's unique among the founders in um, the level and um, precedence of his heroics. Everything from when he was a general to a president to his life thereafter. Happy birthday, George. What's up, y'all? This is Shelby checking in from beautiful Miami Beach. What I admire most about George Washington is how multi-dimensional he was. He was an entrepreneur, he was a leader in the military, he was a president, and what I really respect about him was his ability to examine the world around him, question his opinions, question his assumptions, and ultimately evolve his beliefs. I think he is a shining example of the type of leadership we still need today in the United States, and I'm super excited to wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday, George Washington! Hi, I'm Anthony Gonzalez, U.S. Representative of Ohio's 16th District. As the son and grandson of Cuban immigrants, I will never take for granted the freedoms and the liberties awarded to us in this wonderful nation. In this country, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And there is no greater giant than George Washington. The America we know today, a home for people like me and my family, would not exist but for the courage, decency, and wisdom of George Washington. Thank you, George, and my family and I wish you a very happy birthday. Hi, we are from Clay Allen Rawson High School in Clay Allen, Washington State. We celebrate George Washington for his leadership and innovations in agriculture. Although he is best known for his presidency, his investments in farming has been a lasting impact.
Happy birthday, George Washington! Well, Washington becomes president uh, in the spring of 1789, and then he sets off on the first of what will be five tours. He has to get from Mount Vernon to the new uh, temporary capital of New York. So that means he's, he's in the, the official state coach and he makes his way up through Baltimore, Philadelphia, uh, all the way uh, ultimately to New York. He was really did not want to leave Mount Vernon. He was the most reluctant president, I think, that's ever was inaugurated. And so he set off in October of 1789 on his New England tour. He uh, headed out to New Haven, to Springfield, Boston, all the way up to Kittery Point, Maine, which he visited while he was uh, doing a harbor tour of Portsmouth, and then back. He comes back to New York, and that spring, he goes on the most mysterious of his journeys. He does a completely unreported in the papers a tour of Western Long Island. And why? Why did he do this? It was four days, but it took him to what was the spy capital of uh, Long Island uh, during the Revolutionary War. And it seems clear that Washington used this as an opportunity to thank, at least by gesture, if not by word, uh, those involved. He, everywhere he went, um, he, he followed the, the, the Great South Bay to the south, then cut across Long Island to Setauket, and, uh, and then made his way to Oyster Bay and eventually back to New York. And people greeted him as they had done on his inaugural tour. But this was all under the radar, and uh, for me, it was one of the more fascinating uh, tours to, to uh, retrace. And then his, his next tour uh, was kind of completely un, you know, unexpected. Rhode Island finally ratifies the Constitution, and, and Washington, that summer of 1790, makes the decision to go visit Rhode Island. Uh, he's in New York still, and he hops onto a packet vessel, sails to Newport. The people are astounded. You know, we didn't even have the opportunity to vote for this guy since we weren't in the, you know, a member of the United States of America at that point, but he's made the effort. And then he also went to Providence and uh, in succeeding in turning some of the country's greatest skeptics into some of his biggest fans. Soon after, uh, the temporary capital, for political reasons, is moved to Philadelphia. And it's from Philadelphia that he launches on his final tour, the Tour of the South, the most ambitious of them all. Uh, 1,800 miles. Remember, he's traveling by horse-drawn carriage. And it would take him three months. He would venture as far south as Savannah, Georgia, and then ultimately inland uh, to Augusta, and then back Mount Vernon. And what's interesting about that tour is it, uh, it bookends his efforts to create the new national capital that will become Washington, D.C. And so he's received generally uh, with elation. Remember, Washington at this time was the most popular man in America, if not the world. After eight years of the revolution, uh, he had done the impossible and helped begin a, an independent nation. Well, you know, what Washington saw as the real uh, reason behind this tour was to forge a sense of national unity. You know, we're a divided country today. Uh, the, the sense of the United States of America being the country was, was new. Uh, and Washington was trying to gain this, uh, you know, create this sense of true nationhood. And he, he also knew his popularity could help be useful to him in this regard. And so what he gained uh, was a sense of nationhood at the very beginning. You know, now we look to it as kind of a foregone conclusion. It was, it was not that way at the beginning. Uh, as, as Madison said at one point, we are in a wilderness without any way forward. And Washington helped create that way forward. And it was a great story about Washington's Absolutely. tour down south by Nathaniel Filbert. And, and I know he traveled up north as well. Don't we have a package? Uh, we do. We have a few. We have Manhattan, Philadelphia, and Nantucket. Nantucket's amazing. It's absolutely idyllic. If you have not been, 
please bid on it, check it out. You will not regret it. If you've been, you know how magical it is, so you'll know how great the package is. So please bid. And this is a special package, a Nantucket hotel for three nights and a one bedroom suite. You'll also receive four tickets and a VIP tour to the Nantucket Whaling Museum. Sign books, In the Heart of the Sea. Signed and by Nathaniel Philbrick himself. Na Nathaniel Philbrick wrote In the Heart of the Sea and Away Offshore. He signed these books for us. They're incredible keepsakes. Brush Man. up on your history before we go. Before you please go. do. Sorry, I interrupted you. Okay, now we're gonna have a string quartet performance on the piazza overlooking the mighty Potomac. A perfect soundtrack to peruse, bid, and buy these auction items. So get, get bidding. Keep bidding. in session. Gordon Wood is now going to tell us a story about George Washington's first Supreme Court. Woo! Well, the court was a very different institution from what it is now. Uh, there were only six members, I think, in the original court, and uh, the court did not have the prestige that it has acquired or, or began to acquire when Marshall took over in the early uh, uh, 19th century. So John Jay, who was a New Yorker and uh, was a major figure in the 1780s, was appointed the first Chief Justice. He, I don't think he was entirely happy with his role. Uh, 
And uh, he was asked in the middle of the tenure uh, to go to England and negotiate a treaty with, with Great Britain. So the role of the justices was ambiguous. They were magistrates as well as judicial uh, figures. That kind of um, dual role changes in the early 19th century. The judges throw off their older magisterial role. Washington was very shrewd picker of people, and he was, knew that the offices that he had to fill, including the cabinet and including the court, should be people of prominence, people who had some kind of political position. He was not averse to picking people who had been governors or uh, political officials. In fact, that was more important to him. But he, he was also aware of diversity, uh, that is geographical diversity. He was going to have New Englanders as well as middle state people like Jay. Uh, and so he, and he wanted good bright people like, like uh, Wilson from uh, Pennsylvania. I don't think George Washington thought that the court was going to be the most important uh, branch in any way. Um, the Congress was obviously what he was most concerned with. Uh, no one in the 1790s could have imagined the kind of role that the court began to develop in the 19th century. And of course, nobody, even in the 19th century, could imagine the role that the court has now assumed in our, uh, in our society. The court's development was uh, long and slow, but uh, Washington certainly had no, and no one else had any anticipation of the kind of role the court now plays in our lives. When we think about the precedents that George Washington set, we often don't really think about some of the fundamental things that needed to be brought together for the first time in this union in an organized way. And one of the most critical ideas was naturalization. How do all these people coming to the United States of America become part of the people, the people that rule? How are they naturalized? How do they become citizens? Uh, and that's a critical reason why the Constitution was written, to create a uniform naturalization policy. You couldn't have one process of becoming a citizen in the state of New York and one process in the state of Georgia and one process in the state of Massachusetts. You needed one process that was universal across this new nation to create a national people. And so whether you were born in the United States as a citizen or whether you migrated here, there had to be a route in which those citizens could become one thing. And so to do that was the process called naturalization. And the naturalization law that was created in Washington's first term as president was the first law to create a uniform bill of naturalization. And it really set the standard for all those that came after, including the one that exists today. One of the most exciting things that happens every year at Mount Vernon is we welcome new citizens, uh, people who've traveled from all over the world. Uh, many times 40 different countries are represented of the 100 new citizens we might make a year at Mount Vernon. Uh, and uh, they have passed the citizenship test. They have learned the history of this country uh, and they make an oath uh, not only to honor the Constitution but to renounce all foreign potentates. And in that sense, uh, naturalized citizens are recreating the revolutionary role that people like George Washington himself did. He renounced foreign potentates and pledged to protect the Constitution of the United States. So they're recreating this revolutionary act of being reborn as American citizens. Now, and it really is the thing that makes our country unique, this incredible nation of immigrants, uh, which has drawn people from all over the world for more opportunity, for more liberty, and more freedom. And it all began in George Washington's presidency with the first bills of naturalization. Now in his presidency itself, there were two bills passed. Uh, one that allowed people to become citizens very easily after being here for two years, and then it was extended to five years residency once the politics of his era uh, became engaged with him. People start worried about whether or not people could become true Americans after such a short stay and how you made sure that people were uh, wedded to the interests of this country. Uh, and that is the conversation Americans have had from the beginning. How do we make new citizens out of people that visit uh, this place? So, so the debates and the stories of our founding continue to resonate today because we still live in a country of citizens where citizens rule that great experiment in democracy which George Washington so eloquently described. 
So when you think about the firsts of Washington's administration, recognize that these firsts are part of a continuum of the world that we now inhabit, that we have the power to continually reform and make a more perfect union together. I like this banjo clock. Oh, I like that. That's good looking. Mm -hmm. Look at this pennant. This pennant would look amazing. Look at this thing right here in like a, any office or anywhere in a house. All right, so what, what you're doing, what we're doing is we're looking at one screen and we're bidding on another. That's what you should be doing. That's what I hope you're doing. Take a look. at the, act, the auction is live. It's happening. It's going on and people are bidding things up. So please don't, don't turn away. You may lose your item. So bidding what, closes at 10 p.m. Eastern. 10 p.m. All right, so what, all right, what else? What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Barbersville. Barbersville. Trip for two. That looks expensive. Yes. All right. Yep. We're still okay. All right. Okay. We're still big. All right. I got one. I got one. I got one. All right. Don't laugh. Okay. Don't laugh. All right. All right. This George Washington hatchet. I like it. All right. We're going to keep bidding then. All right. Give me my phone. All right. Make sure no one else gets it. Okay. All right. So keep bidding, folks. Keep bidding. Keep bidding. It, it, time's running out. Keep going. Keep bidding. It all goes to Mont Vernon. Thank it's you. It's for a really good cause. Yep. Keep bidding. Hello, I am Rahul Amin Kwander, director of the Kwanda Historical and Educational Society, and I'm here at George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate to enlighten you how our national capital city, Washington, D.C., came to be where it is and how it got its name. In 1790, the new Congress adopted the Residence Act, authorizing the creation of a new capital city. The question was whether it should be really brand new or a city that already existed but might be retrofitted to become the capital of the new nation. After some debate, they decided on a fresh start, a brand new capital city, something to be a very modern thing in that context. The question then was where to put it. The Southern interests wanted a Southern geographical area, someplace more sympathetic to the institution of slavery. Some groups and individuals mostly Northerners, were agitating against the cruelty of slavery. So the enslavers wanted to contain that slowly growing sentiment, which as you know, decades later led to the Civil War. With several other issues of the post-Revolutionary War still on the table, it was negotiated that the political capital would be placed in the South, while the economic capital would be Philadelphia which was largely already serving in that capacity. Today, we often think of Pennsylvania Avenue as America's main street. Now, there is some thought, although apparently not in writing, that the street name was a compromise, put the political capital in the South, but the nation's main street would be named for a major northern state. I bet you didn't know that before today. The site selection decision having been made the state of Maryland seated 69 square miles, and the state of Virginia seated 31 square miles, establishing a 100 square mile area for the new capital. For a brief time, the site was called the Federal City in the Territory of Columbia, recognizing Christopher Columbus. But in September 1791, the name was changed to Washington Territory of Columbia. And later still, in 1871, the name as we now know it became Washington, District of Columbia, or just plain Washington, D.C. So how was President Washington involved with the physical development of this site? I'd like to visit that a little bit. He was much involved with the construction of the federal city. His professional skills as a surveyor, complemented by his his interest in architecture, he personally engaged in getting the Capitol and the President's House, which today we call the White House, built. He closely followed the progress on the construction of other buildings too, and the laying down of the streets. He was hands-on regularly up until about two weeks before his death, checking on the incremental progress. He selected Pierre L'Enfant, a Revolutionary War veteran and highly respected engineer and architect from Paris. L'Enfant's plan, with Washington's concurrence, was to be the ultimate plan for the city. L'Enfant set out 
to create the federal national city with wide boulevards, plazas, and many green spaces modeled somewhat after Paris. We didn't just happen. It took a long time to get this done. Who built it? How do they build it? Well, until recently, this backstory has been rather subliminal. The commissioners were initially hoping to bring in relatively cheap labor from the surrounding areas. They also reached out to Europeans and got some Irish, Germans, Italians, what have you, but quickly realized that there were not enough takers of that group in order to get it done in a timelier manner. They then reached out locally to many of the enslaving masters and contracted to bring enslaved labor. This was a prime place to do that because there were about 750,000 enslaved Africans in the area, more than any other place in the entire emerging country. Many of these enslavers rented this enslaved Africans out to build the new capital city. The masters got the money and some of them got very rich. The enslaved, they got nothing, except some got killed or gravely injured in construction accidents. That's a real tragedy. These hundreds of men and a few women in domestic service who built the city did the heavy lifting, cutting the stone block on block, brick on brick. Their labor from the 1790s until emancipation were both monetarily uncompensated and unnamed. They too deserve recognition as founders, founding fathers, if you will. A few women too, founding mothers as well. Washington, D.C. is a unique place looking at it today. It represents the past, the present, and the future. George Washington City represents one of the great jewels of the world. People come to D.C. from around the globe yearning to breathe free by reason of being here. They see Washington, D.C. and the operation gloriously representing the future if somebody would ask me one word I would use to describe Washington, D.C., I would say that one word is power, as George Washington conceived it as such. And his dream has been realized. I think sometimes we allow ourselves to get a little skewed because of other important issues that are part of our country. My own family, the Quanders, we are traced to George Washington's Mount Vernon, having been in a slave service to the Washingtons for decades. But we always put that fact into a perspective, recognizing that we are here, we are in this great city, largely because of his vision and his foresight. But we never forget, nor will we, those men, women, and children largely enslaved who were back at Mount Vernon serving him in all capacities, who made it possible for him to rise up, become the father of our great nation, and to engage in getting this great world capital city, Washington, D.C., created. Thank you. George Washington was a president without precedent. He was setting the mold and he knew it. He was trying to forge a national character out of 13 disparate states and he was doing it through the force of his own character. So everything he did, every step he took was to set an example for future generations to follow. And that was certainly true with his farewell address. You know, we take it for granted now, but of course a peaceful transfer of power is the essence of democracy. And until George Washington came along, the routine had been that a tyrant was deposed by a revolutionary leader who soon became a tyrant himself. But as Thomas Jefferson said about George Washington, it was the moderation and virtue of this single character that helped the American Revolution from ending very differently as all others had been. So by the end of his second term, Washington wanted to retire. He was always a reluctant president. He'd been convinced to stay on for a second term because the one thing that Alexander and Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson could agree upon was that if Washington left too soon, America could even then dissolve into civil war. After eight years, the country was steady. In many cases, the precedent had been set. And so Washington set about finishing farewell address, a 6,000 word letter to his friends and fellow citizens. 
sum total of his hard-won wisdom about life in war and peace, written as a warning to future generations of Americans about the forces he feared could still derail and destroy our democracy. Chief among these were what we would call hyper-partisanship, excessive debt, the dangers of foreign wars, and foreign interference in our domestic politics. It's a pretty pressing guy. But it's the mere fact of resigning and walking away from power that drew parallels to the Roman Senator Cincinnatus. He was willing to leave power and hand it into new hands, a new generation. And that became the essence and the exemplar of democracy. He'd done it before. When he left power after leaving the Continental Army, writing his first farewell address, or what was known at that at the time, prompting King George III of Britain to say, if he does that, i.e. if he's willing to walk away from power after having achieved it, he'll be the greatest man in the history of the world. Washington had been accused by many critics of being a would-be monarch, but those concerns were demolished the day he published his farewell address in a newspaper in Philadelphia. And he set that example forward. He gave all the wisdom and warnings to future generations about the things that he feared could destroy us if we were divided and about the virtues we needed to keep in mind if we were to remain united and independent nation. It was celebrated as civic scripture, but it was as much the action itself that was revolutionary. It is what secured the American Revolution. It's what made it different. It is what established our democracy by establishing the peaceful transfer of power and the idea that a president could leave power voluntarily and hand it over to an open election between competing political parties who disagreed intensely at times. The election of 1800 was ugly between Vice President John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, the former Secretary of State turned prominent Washington administration critic. Adams won the first round and rematch, Jefferson won, and that's when he gave his inaugural address and said, we are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. That solidified the lessons of Washington's farewell, the peaceful transfer of power that guarantees democracy's success. That, as much as any of the specific bits of wisdom in his farewell address, which can seem ripped out of the headlines for today, are what we constantly need to remember as citizens of a self-governing democratic republic, the peaceful transfer of power, handing over our nation to the next generation better than it was handed to us. That's what George Washington did. Happy birthday, George. I have several reasons why I celebrate George Washington's birthday, February 22nd. My youngest brother, George, was born on George Washington's birthday. And uh, so I never, ever, ever forget the original George Washington, first president of the United States of America. And every single time I venture south from New York to Washington, D.C., I make a journey to Mount Vernon, George Washington's beautiful home on the Potomac River. I love visiting Mount Vernon. I love looking at the gardens, at the landscape, at the house itself, and of all the wonderful discoveries that are constantly being made at that beautiful, beautiful construction. So happy birthday, George. Happy birthday, George Washington. Happy birthday and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my honor to introduce to you the 23rd region of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, Meg Nichols from the great state of Maine. Good evening. I'm Meg Nichols, the 23rd region of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. I am honored to head the association board of 22 dynamic women from across the nation, serving as vice regents and custodians of the home of George Washington. Long before the campaign for women's rights and decades before the heyday of the environmental movement, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association was breaking new ground in both these areas. But the formation of the association was much more than a chapter in women's history or the first step toward the rescue of America's most important historic home. It marked the emergence of the National Preservation Movement. It took the bold leadership of Anne Pamela Cunningham to establish the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in 1853. 
She made up her mind that the home which George Washington loved would not be allowed to crumble in ruin. And much like George Washington, Anne Pamela Cunningham had a knack of picking talented and dynamic women to assist her. Together, the first 22 women of the newly formed Mount Vernon Ladies Association rallied the nation and raised the $200,000 that John Augustine Washington III, then owner of Mount Vernon, demanded for the property. Ms. Cunningham insisted that everything merited saving and kept the many ancillary outbuildings on the estate for later restoration. This inclusive approach to historic places would evolve into the guiding principles of our national preservation movement. This progressive approach to preservation includes the Mount Vernon Ladies Association far-sighted work started in the 1950s to preserve George Washington's beloved Potomac River view. Over the years, against the threat of oil refineries, sanitation plants, commercial development, and even water contamination, the association continues its conservation efforts, working with our many public and private partners to ensure Washington's view remains largely unchanged. The association's mission of preservation and education continues to thrive and expand through the library, scholarly research, and efforts. This research has contributed immeasurably to the country's knowledge of George Washington, life at Mount Vernon, and of the enslaved community whose lives were entwined with the Washingtons and Mount Vernon. Our work is truly never finished, and such is the nature of preservation and education. There was always more to learn, more to discover, and more to share. While we have welcomed over 85 million visitors to the estate, we are also reaching millions of visitors through our digital footprint. We use 21st century technology tools, such as this live stream, as well as social media platforms and the vibrant mountvernon.org website to connect with millions of people around the world. Informing and inspiring with extensive digital programming, such as educational outreach, book talks at the library, in-depth behind the scenes conversations with our staff and curators, and even lively digital conversations with the prominent historians and civic leaders of George Washington's life and leadership. As America's first historic preservation organization, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and its continuous succession of remarkable women who have owned and operated Mount Vernon for over 160 years without interruption. The association is a private organization that does not accept government funding. We depend on generous individuals, organizations, foundations, and corporations to help support the preservation and restoration of Mount Vernon and our long-standing educational programs. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association is proud of its accomplishments and of its heritage as preservation pioneers. It is fitting that the beloved home of the man who was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen was saved from ruin by a group of undeterred women who were first in historic preservation. On behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, I thank you for your unwavering support. Now, on to the celebration. Happy 290th birthday, General Washington. The year was 1853. Mount Vernon, the home of America's first president, had fallen into disrepair. And much like the nation on the verge of civil war, the future of Washington's estate was in jeopardy. But in the mansion's worn facade, a trailblazing woman saw an opportunity to preserve Mount Vernon for all Americans as a symbol of civic virtue. Founding the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, Anne Pamela Cunningham and her colleagues embarked on a journey to restore the home of America's founding father. Little did they know the many layers of history this journey would uncover. As restoration began, the MVLA faced a considerable challenge. Most of Mount Vernon's original furnishings, expressions of the Washington's personal identities, were missing, either inherited, sold, or lost. And without them, visitors could not fully experience George and Martha Washington's world. So, the ladies of the MVLA embarked on a formidable mission, a hunt 
for lost treasures. For more than a century, they've worked tirelessly to assemble Mount Vernon's original artifacts with impressive results. George Washington's dress sword, his presidential chair, the harpsichord of his adopted granddaughter. Objects that bring us closer to George Washington, the soldier, the statesman, the family man. As research and restoration continued, the MVLA recovered treasures from an even broader history. Nearly 600 enslaved people lived and labored at Mount Vernon during Washington's 45-year residence. Archaeology has revealed many objects that bring their stories to life, like that of brickmaker Gunner, whose fingers may still mark one of thousands of bricks that he shaped by hand. A shoe buckle, a jaw harp, a button, artifacts of great meaning to people whose lives were spent in bondage came to light. The MVLA even began to uncover layers of human history from long before. An ornamental stone with the initials of Washington's grandfather, owner of this shoreline property in the 17th century, or the spear tip of a hunter walking the very same shoreline nearly 10,000 years earlier. The picture of Mount Vernon's past has taken shape with detail far greater than Anne Pamela Cunningham could have imagined. Since the MVLA began, Mount Vernon has brought millions of people together to learn about our shared past, adding new chapters to the history of this place. Yet, as a trailblazer envisioned, one thing remains unchanged. The promise of this American icon to inspire, to intrigue, and to tell the stories of the people who helped shape it. Okay, you ready, you guys? Let's go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, George Washington. Happy birthday to you. Blow out the candles. Blow out the candles. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Back up. We can't get too close. Uh, All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us this evening in recognition of George Washington's 290th birthday. I invite you to join me and raise your glass in celebration of George Washington, the indispensable man, and to his beloved Mount Vernon that stands not only as a living memorial to his legacy, but as a beacon to all who believe in the democratic ideal. Hip, hip, huzzah! Happy birthday! Man, what a great time tonight. Thank you all so much for your support. Have you all had a good time tonight? Yeah! All right, so look, keep bidding. The auction's open until 10 o'clock, and right now let's do one more final huzzah. Are you ready? Yeah! Hip, hip, huzzah! Thank you.